Good evening, and welcome to our Waltham Public Library program, Black History and Racism in America with Michael Curry. This program is made possible through CARES Act funding to Federal Institute of Museum and Library Services as administered by the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. My name is Deborah Hoffman and I organize programs and events for the library. Thank you for tuning in. Um, before we start, I wanna let you know how the evening will go. Our speaker will do a 45 minute presentation and then we'll do Q and A. Um, to ask questions via the chat function, use a Google account to sign into YouTube. Feel free to write your questions at any time and then I'll read them at the end of the presentation. Following the presentation, I will ask you all to answer a yes or no question as required by our grant funding. Did you learn something by participating in this program? Michael Curry is a board member of the National NAACP. Over to you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, I want to say it's a pleasure, an honor to be with you. Um, too bad we couldn't be in person in Waltham. Uh, but the last year we've been uh, distancing and trying to still have conversations, as I call them, critical conversations, uh, as we used to refer to them as courageous conversations. Um, I want to start uh, by you know, saying thank you to the Waltham uh, Public Library for having this conversation. Uh, and thank you to all of those of you who are tuning in. Uh, and I'll introduce you to this presentation that I've, over the last year, have maybe done 50 times called Quantum Leap. And I think uh, to what uh, Deborah, uh, Ms. Hoffman asked of me, which is to really share some history to talk about uh, this racial reckoning moment that we're in in the country, uh, this presentation will help tremendously towards that, towards that end. So I'm going to take a check with Deborah and make sure that the screen is showing. Uh, there's a slight time lag, so it hasn't shown yet, uh, but it will. Okay, why don't we get started as soon as it comes up. So we'll give it one second to make sure it comes up and Deborah will have to check as we move between slides too to make sure that it's uh, timed with my remarks. Um, so I will tell you a little bit about me as we open up this presentation. I am a child of Roxbury. Uh, I was born at Boston City Hospital, raised uh, most of my young life in Lenox Street Housing Projects, which is on the, uh, what you would call the end of Roxbury in Boston and uh, the beginning of South End. Um, I was the first born in Massachusetts in Boston. My mother moved here. If you've ever read the book by Elizabeth Wilkerson, Warmth of Other Sons, uh, moved out of the Jim Crow South uh, in the 60s, moved to Boston for domestic work. Uh, and ended up working in hotels. And then most of my lifetime, including today, she's worst worked as a domestic worker, a housekeeper for a family in Chestnut Hill. Uh, so we got to see the best of uh, that world, which is wealth and opportunity and quality education and, and all that comes with that. And then go home uh, to the community we lived in and the projects on welfare and uh, the crime uh, the incarceration rates and all that comes with uh, living in communities like Roxbury or Southside Chicago or St. Louis or North Minneapolis, name the communities across the country. Um, but as I was growing up, I had a challenge. I didn't understand the community that I grew up in because I didn't understand why so many people who look like me were dealing with those same challenges. And then uh, I would travel to New York or Alabama or Chicago or Minneapolis, St. Paul for college. And I would see black people living in the same conditions. And of course you internalize that. What is wrong with us that we're living in these conditions no matter where I travel? It doesn't mean every black person was living in those conditions. It just means that too many, disproportionately, too many black and brown folks were incarcerated at higher rates, were dying of almost every disease at a higher rate, uh, were living in poverty and uh, lacking wealth. Uh, were dealing with discrimination in their jobs and in public spaces. Uh, and I decided that I wanted to tell a story about how we got here. That too often we, we blame the people, the victims in these circumstances and don't connect the dots of history. 
Uh, for those of you who take advantage of well, a Waltham Public Library uh, and maybe uh, spent some time in that library reading Souls of Black Folks or The Miseducation of the Negro or uh, autobiographies or bloods about uh, Black veterans in the military or the host of other books that I've read and wish that you read uh, about some of these critical points in history. If you had done that, then all of it would make more sense to you of connecting those dots, but most Americans have not. So I, do, I call this presentation Quantum Leap. It's a collection of historical facts from many sources presented in a chronology that helps audiences to connect the dots to the racial inequities, disparities, and injustices that continue to plague society. The presentation is now over 150 slides, and, and Deborah, do not panic. I'm not going to do 150 slides, um, but I will condense this down to what we'll call 40 minutes. But I will tell you, uh, depending on the audience, I'll do uh, quite a bit of a talk on, on the argument around reparations for and against on employment dis discrimination. I just did this presentation for Mass General Brigham, which is the old partners healthcare and all of their employees. And I did a heavy healthcare focus, uh, both the history of the taint of, of health, race in our healthcare system, all the way up to why we can't equitably distribute vaccines in this moment, uh, or criminal injustice and uh, police violence. So I will do a snapshot of all of that for you today in this presentation and welcome uh, any of your comments and questions at the end of the presentation. Why do I call it Quantum Leap? Uh, for those of us who are maybe over 45 50, or 40, you'll remember there was a TV show in the late 80s, early 90s called uh, Quantum Leap. Uh, which featured uh, an, uh, the character Sam Beckett. I was a TV kid, a TV young adult, and I loved this theme that he would travel back in time and jump into the body of a person and then have to resolve the issue they were dealing with in that moment. And I was a kid, as a kid, I used to think to myself, if I could go back in time, where would I go? And as I would have this conversation with other young people, they would say all these great grand places, I would go back to these great moments in history. And I would tell them I'd go back to 1619 with the arrival of the slaves. I would go back to reconstruction. I would go back to Birth of a Nation and D.W. Griffith's film. And of course, I'd look like the, the warped kid who wanted to go back to these horrible moments in history. But the reality is I wanted to go back to get the sights, the sounds, the experiences that too often we don't understand. And therefore, uh, we operate in the today's time as if those things never existed. So this episode of uh, Quantum Leap and uh, went back to May 11th, 1965, where Sam Beckett jumped back in time and he jumped into the body of a Ku Klux Klan member and had to resolve the circumstances, including the uh, lynching of a black man. So I ask you during the course of this presentation, I want you to quantum leap. I want you to leave where you are in Waltham or in areas outside of Waltham, your home, your living rooms, your kitchens, you may be cooking food, but I'm asking you in the course of this presentation to quantum leap with me, because it's one thing to hear about it, to read about it, but it's another thing to put yourself in those circumstances and those places, and that's what I'm asking of you to tonight. I don't want to start here to level set us with where we are. Um, 103 million cases of COVID-19 worldwide with over 2.2 million deaths, and I want to introduce you, Deborah, to a term Research is called the weathering effect. The weathering effect is a term that they described to me as they said they went in and asked black parents to rate their kids asthma from one to 10. And mothers like my mother, I had asthma, rated the kids asthma uh, three, fours, and fives. And then the doctors came in and evaluated those same kids and they were eight, nines, and tens. And the way they introduced it to us is you can get so weathered to being in the emergency room like I was, like my sister was, like my mother was every month or every quarter. You can get so used to taking that pump or popping that pill to treat your asthma every day, two, three times a day, that you become weathered to being sick. So I ask you, as we are in this conversation about weathering, are you weathered to 103 million cases worldwide and 2.2 million deaths and counting? Are you weathered to 26 million cases in the US and over 445,000 deaths? Are you weathered to the 504,000 cases here in Massachusetts and the over 14,400 deaths? I need you not to be weathered, but I ask the question, particularly as I talk to African-Americans and, and other people of color 
And I asked this question, are you weathered to getting stopped by police because you, because you fit some vague profile? Are you weathered to getting asked for your ID with your credit card when the white customer in front of you didn't get asked for their ID? Are you weathered to being followed around a department store? Are you weathered to auntie and uncle Nim dying of diabetes and heart disease and cancer at a higher rate, living five, 10, 15 years le less? Are you weathered to living in poverty? Are you weathered to being discriminated against? Are you, if you're not a person of, person of color, are you weathered to those conditions for other people? Do you think about it? Are you active in doing something about it? So you'll see at the bottom of this slide, I mentioned some key equity issues as we're dealing with COVID-19 now, and most importantly and most urgently is the distribution of vaccines. But I just want you to take that slide in around so many equity issues, because we know black and brown people are essential workers. We know they're the frontline workers, our first responders, our healthcare providers, our nurses, our medical assistants, our home care providers. We know that we're mass incarcerated and prisons are 60 plus percent black and brown across this country because of mass incarceration, read the new Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander's book. Uh, Deborah didn't tell me to give you homework, but I'm giving homework out on this talk tonight. So I'm gonna ask you to understand all those things as we have a conversation about being weathered and about equity in this moment of COVID-19. The pandemic's racial disparity, and you'll see, and I'll just touch on these things now. I'm gonna warn you now, this is a uh, drinking from a fire hose. So while you're quantum leaping, there's not a lot of time to spend too much time on slides. My goal is to really give you what you would get in four years of an African-American studies course or an honest American history course, and then have that be the beginning of your own personal research as you go and check these things and do your own study. COVID-19 death for 100,000 people in the US by race and ethnicity. I want you to pay attention to the slide as you see that this has borne a disproportionate impact on black and brown communities with black and brown uh, folks dying being hospitalized and being infected at two to three times the rate of white Americans. Black people uh, as a share of COVID-19 vaccines, cases and total populations, you'll see that in the top right, um, based on vaccinations, cases we're not being vaccinated at the rate that we should be based on our infections and our hospitalizations and our deaths. Why is that? Uh, is that the institutional racism we talked about because we don't know how to do things equitably? Is that also because there's a hesitancy in our country because we don't trust systems, we don't trust the vaccine, we don't trust the medical inst institutions and we'll have a conversation about where that distrust comes from. Is that, as uh, an author once wrote, is that uh, medical apartheid? Age-adjusted COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates, take a look at that slide. The data is there for you to take a look at is we have a problem that will lead to a longer recovery for black and brown folks, more death, more hospitalization, even as we have Moderna, Pfizer, and soon to be Johnson & Johnson. Dr. King left us with a quote of many great things that this man said, and, and we should still take note of today. He said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. That was Dr. King on March 1966, the Medical Committee for Human Rights, held in Chicago. Quick picture, you'll see the bottom right is a picture of Dr. Jack uh, Geiger. He was the founder, one of the founders of the Health Center Movement, which I get to represent in my role as president and CEO for the 52 community health centers across Massachusetts, serving over a million patients on the front line of responding to this pandemic. Uh, and you'll see in 1965, the nation's first community health centers were launched as a small demonstration program as part of the Lyndon Johnson's Office of Economic Opportunity. This was the war on poverty. This was a part of the civil rights movement. There were activists who came out of the uh, civil rights movement and figured that healthcare needed to have uh, champions. Healthcare needed to have a movement as well. And they met with uh, uh, prominent people like Jack Geiger, Count Gibson, Dr. John Hatch, uh, Dr. Smith in Mississippi, the late Senator Kennedy, and launched a movement that would bring health centers into communities black and brown from the first health center in, in Columbia Point in Dorchester to Mount Bayou, Mississippi, a model of bringing healthcare uh, brought from South Africa uh, and what Jack Geiger and his colleagues has, had watched in South Africa and brought that into the United States. Uh, and now is a movement across this country 
if you've seen one health center, you've seen one health center, but you can walk into one and you can see Haitian, Cape Verdean, Irish, Italian, um, Laotian, depending on where you are in this country, it is serving the patients. And most importantly, Deborah, I think is important is that over half of their boards have to be people who are patients of those communities. That's a consumer board member model so that you're, as Ayanna Pressley, our Congresswoman says, those closest to the pain need to be closest to the power. Now, I, I have you do this quantum leap and I want you to remember Carter G. Woodson, the father of Negro History Week, which we now know. And as of uh, three days ago, we entered Black History Month. He argued that history was not the mere gathering of facts. The object of historical study is to arrive at a reasonable interpretation of the facts. I know we live in a generation where the facts right now don't seem to matter, but that is not this presentation. So I want to time warp for a second back to 1918 and the Spanish flu, also known as uh, that flu pandemic, the Spanish flu, arguably for those who don't know the history, Spain was one of the first country, countries to even acknowledge that there was a flu, which is why it's named after the, the Spanish, uh, or after Spain and the Spanish flu. Uh, it was an, an usually dead influenza. Uh, the past is prologue, 1918 to December 1920, infecting 500 million people worldwide. And of course, these numbers are almost certainly uh, underestimated. Over a quarter of the world's population with 5 million deaths, over 675,000 people just here in the United States. Uh, and we were at war at the time. Uh, in 1990, 1918, we had not yet discovered flu viruses, no lab tests to detect, no vaccines poor infrastructure and life-saving tools. But why am I telling you this in the context of racism? Uh, because of Jim Crow, deplorable living conditions, lack of access to healthcare, America, African-Americans were extremely susceptible to the outbreak. The same conditions in 1918 exist today. We were in congested households. We were food and housing insecure. We didn't have the resources. We couldn't stock up on water and food uh, and PPE. Uh, we didn't have, we were incarcerated at higher rates. We were just a few decades out of slavery. Uh, just on the heels of Jim Crow. Uh, we couldn't shelter in place because we had critical jobs and, and, and roles in society. And the death toll in the spring of 1918 was severe. Uh, some would argue that the death toll was disproportionately born on white communities by the fall because of herd immunity. And so many black people had been infected in the spring of 1918 uh, that when it came back more deadly and mutated in the fall of 1918, uh, it took a different toll on black Americans. I will not argue that I'm not a, a scientist, or, uh, but I've done the research, which is to understand that this is the past is prologue, and we did not pay attention to the history of lesson, the lessons of history. I want you to work with me, quantum leap with me back to 1619. Uh, arguably, there were slaves that arrived before 1619, but the official recognize, recognition of the arrival of slaves in 1619, those 20 or so odd slaves, uh, Africans who arrived. Uh, who many would argue were indentured servants, Deborah, but we know that indentured servants had limitations on their service. Africans did not. Uh, but I want you to pay attention to that slave ship on the bottom and the deplorable conditions and the diseases that were born uh, on those ships and the death and some of those who decided to jump ship instead of uh, being held captive. Those 250 untold stories of rebellions of those slaves to free themselves on those slave ships beyond the movie Amistad that some of you may have watched. Um, the deplorable conditions of slavery. I need you to think about 1619 as we quantum leap. Uh, we just had a debate here in Boston about putting up a, uh, some sort of a monument to uh, the institution of slavery in Faneuil Hall. Uh, and there was a, a pretty tense debate where many black advocates fought against it because of the trauma that we still feel when we think about generations later, the indignities, the violence, the sexual abuse, um, the, in, the inhuman treatment, inhumane treatment, I should say, of people uh, of African descent in this country. And many people fought to not have that auction block um, uh, put up in uh, Faneuil Hall and that, that monument to uh, one of um, the most significant injustices in, in criminal activities in this, in this world's uh, history. I want you to pay attention to the slave ship. Uh, if you've never been to Baltimore, I need you to visit the Great Blacks and Wax. I need you to mention, visit the new museum uh, in DC, the African-American Museum. 
just so you can walk through and experience what it was like to do that middle passage, that transatlantic slave trade, and what it was like to be uh, crowded in those ships, not fed properly, dealing with diseases, uh, uh, torn from your family, your loved ones. I need you to take that journey across the Atlantic Ocean with those slaves so that when we have conversations about Tamir Rice and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, that you can connect the dots. I need you to get a picture of what that slave trade looked like. We tend to think of the slave trade as just being the United States. Uh, but of course, those who do study and understand the uh, injustice of slavery, understand that slaves were transported across the Atlantic Ocean into many parts of the Americas, traveled to the West Indies and let Jamaicans tell you about slavery or Haiti or uh, any of the rest of the islands or Central America where I was in uh, Central America one time and got to see them celebrate and, and, and speak life to their uh, African heritage, shocked me. Way before I understood the transatlantic slave trade, I need you to know and travel, many of you have traveled to South America and experienced the, the remnants of slavery in the, in the cultures that you visited in South, South America. Um, I won't spend a lot here, this is a text heavy slide, but I'll just bring your attention to the top line of that slide. Near four, nearly 4 million slaves with a market value estimated to be between 3.1 to $3.6 billion lived in the US just before the Civil War. Masters enjoyed rates of return on slaves comparable to those of other assets, including, including what cotton consumers and cotton uh, traders would, would uh, be able to get on the marketplace. I need you to understand the, the property value of slaves. I think if I could go back to my law school days and I can encourage a law school to, to dig into property, even back to slavery and what that meant for the United States and the wealth that it built for many in this country. Slave crimes, you'll see the drawing and quarter that European uh, punishment that we know from across the seas and the brutality of slavery. Uh, I know that we don't always want to face this stuff. I know that looking at it, reading about it, experiencing it yourself is just too, too traumatic. But the problem with not experiencing it and reliving it and, and coming to grips with it is that it can happen again. So I want you to pay attention to what few due process protections protectors existed for slaves really stem from the rights of their masters. I need you to know what the slave crimes were. They included violating curfew, attending religious meetings without a master's consent and running away. Indeed, a slave was not permitted off his master's farm or businesses without his owner's permission. In rural areas, a slave was required to carry a written pass to leave the master's land. Southern states erected numerous punishments for slave crimes, including prison terms, of course, banishment, whipping, castration, and execution. In most states, criminal laws for slaves and blacks generally was noticeably harsher than free whites. Particularly harsh punishments applied to slaves who had allegedly killed their masters and who had committed rebellious acts. As we talk about the fear that black people have about our medical system, what, why don't we start with one of the most significant injustices during slavery, which is the experimentation on slaves. I don't wanna leave you with this presentation thinking that there was only one, and J. Marion Sims probably is the most well-known. Um, he was the father of modern surgical gynecology. So I want you to be in, 19, in the 1800s, and I want you to experience that uh, black people are not full human beings in the eyes of the law. And uh, you can't experiment on uh, white patients unless they're sick, unless they are uh, in need of services and it's a life-saving measure. But you have a, a whole population of people that you can experiment on, whether they're dead or alive, that you don't have any, there's no protections for them. Uh, the J. Marion Sims developed the groundbreaking tools and surgical techniques related to women's reproductive health. He invented the vaginal speculum, a tool used for dilation and examination, practicing at a time when treating women was considered distasteful and rarely done. And he pioneered a surgical technique to repair vessel, vessel vaginal fistula, a common 19th century complication of childbirth in which a tear between the uterus and bladder caused constant pain and urine linkage. I want you to know about um, Annika, Betsy, and Lucy, the women uh, who most known that he operated on in those years. Uh, he was lionized in statutes in New York City, South Carolina, Pennsylvania, Alabama. And you may know this story because they took his statue down uh, in Central Square. 
I won't spend time on this other than uh, when uh, slavery was challenged here in Massachusetts, uh, was a uh, Quaker Walker, uh, was a slave who sued and won his freedom in June 1781. It was a series of cases uh, citing language in the newly approved Massachusetts Constitution in 1718 that declare all men to be born free and equal. The case is credited with helping abolish slavery in the Commonwealth. Uh, I, I just mentioned that because it's significant to know where we are and what the movements have been and the people have been that brought us thus far. You can't quantum leap without uh, in, this, in the history of this country without quantum leaping into reconstruction. Uh, I call that Deborah the Obama years. It was right after slavery. Uh, some slaves were leaving their plantations and traveling, looking for their loved ones who were split up. Um, there was, uh, it, it, and just in case those who don't know the political dynamics of that time, that the movement to end slavery and to start this reconstruction period was really by the radical Republicans. I know that might be a shock to some of you who think of the Republican party today, but radical Republicans, the party of Lincoln, right? So we talk about reconstruction, that period from 1865 to 1877 is a period after the civil war where attempts were made to redress the inequities of slavery and its political, social and economic legacy and to solve the problems arising from the readmission to the union of the 11 states that had seceded at or before the outbreak of the war. Sweeping changes in America's political life from new laws, including constitutional minute, amendments, some of the most significant. These again, I want to stress this. This was the Obama years, the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, some rights that it would take generations to have this country live up to were passed during this period of time that significantly altered systems and the definition of American citizenship. You may not know that 2000 or so African-Americans held public office. That might shock you if you're a 1950s baby or a 1960s baby and you celebrated the election of black leaders across this country. But in these period, at this period of time, 2000 African-Americans held public office all the way from sheriffs up to Congress. And most notably, as we talk about the US Senate, Hiram Revel, the first African-American to serve in the US Senate. Black people were politically mobilizing. Uh, they had joined with white allies to bring the Republican party into power. Um, oh, what a difference a day makes. Sign in the law, the Homestead Act. So if you're a historian on this call or, or maybe you've dug in the books in the library a little bit, you know about the Homestead Act or the Southern Homestead Act. Signed into law by President Lincoln on May 20th, 1862, the second year of the Civil War encourage Western migration by providing settlers 160 acres of public land. So I need you as you quantum leap to make these connections to the wealth gap that exists in this country. We reposition people all the time in America. We re reposition farm workers, veterans, too big to fail airlines, Wall Street. This was the repositioning of former slaves. Homesteaders paid filing fees with application required to complete five years of continuous residence before receiving home ownership of land. After six months of residency, homesteaders also had the option of purchasing the land from the government for $1.25 per acre. Uh, all US citizens, women, African-Americans, freed slaves, and immigrants were eligible to apply for a homestead. The Homestead Act led to the distribution of 80 million acres of public land by 1900. I want you to quantum leap to this period, 18, 80 million acres of public land by 1900. So what happened to these former slaves? And, other, and also paying attention to the Southern Homestead Act. Uh, 40 acres and a mule, you may have heard this, the special order number 15, Union General William T. Sherman, January 6th, 1865, ordered the confiscation of property from Confederate held land stretching from Charleston, South Carolina to Florida, as far as Georgia. The order sought to redistribute 400 acres of land to newly freed black families in 40 acre segments. The order called for the settlement of black families on confiscated land encouraged freedmen to join the union. This had disenfranchised those former Confederates. They lost their land. They lost, in many cases, the right to vote. And now this was the, um, uh, the, in, the invitation to former slaves to participate in that franchise, to be able to vote, to be able to participate in government, to own land. But what happened? Um, I would want to jump here just for, for those who may love a little bit of history, Lee, Rebecca Lee Crumpler, in this moment of COVID-19, was an African-American physician. Uh, her quote was, they seem to forget there is a cause for every ailment and that it may be in their power to remove it. 
1864, she became the first African-American woman to become a doctor of medicine in the US, the only female physician author in the 19th century, published a book of medical discourses, studied at the New England Female Medical College, began her career practicing medicine in Boston, treating women and children, and worked to the, uh, for the Freedmen's Bureau, which was during Reconstruction, the Freedmen's Bureau, providing medical care to former slaves. Post-slavery. Civil War victory opened the door to the 13th Amendment, formally abolished the practice of slavery in the US. Uh, after emancipation, ex-slaves had little to no formal education, no financial means, no property or residence, uh, all keys to economic independence. Uh, we had special order number 15, 40 acres and a mule, which would eventually be blocked. Uh, we lost ground between the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and his successor, uh, who overturned much, or tried to overturn and did overturn much of the progress that had been made under Abraham Lincoln. I don't like to lift up white folks in our history as the only heroes, the Lincolns and the Kennedys of the world, within the Lyndon Johnsons of the world, with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Um, I asked the white folks on this call to go and do a little bit of research on the advocates who beat down the door, who advocated, wrote letters, who campaigned, who um, quite frankly died to get those people to do the right thing is an important part of history. I call many of them unwilling heroes. Uh, and though I appreciate Frederick Douglass, and if you ever want to read, appreciate Abraham Lincoln, if you ever want to read a, a powerful speech about Abraham Lincoln, go read uh, uh, Frederick Douglass's famous speech, his, one of the top 50 speeches of all time that he gave is in recognition of uh, the, uh, the 4th of July and recognizing uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln. Powerful speech. Please read it. Uh, terms like debt peonage or debt slavery. Employers compel workers to pay off debt with work. Uh, Deborah, I tell people all the time, imagine you're freed from the plantation or you've been told you're free and then told that, oh, by the way, you now owe us for the land that you lived on, for the food that we gave you, for the services you got, for, the, for all the things that you didn't pay for. Now you have to stay here and work off your debt or go to prison and then be loaned right back to this plantation or some other plantation. I need you to know about sharecropping, tenancy farming, farming, and convict leasing. All tools that were the, the tools that were used during Reconstruction, post-slavery, to still keep people in bondage. So though we've ended the official practice of slavery, the institution of slavery existed well beyond the Emancipation Proclamation of the 13th Amendment. Black codes, laws intended to restrict the freedom of Black folks of African-Americans to maintain the availability of cheap labor after slavery was abolished. Often the codes required former slaves to sign yearly labor contracts, which kept them from the Homestead Act, which kept them from the Southern Homestead Act. And refusing to sign could result in arrest, fines, and forced unpaid labor. And you'll see there are some states in 1865 that led the way on these black codes. So here's what happens, right? I call these the Obama years, and this is sort of the end of the Obama years as we enter the Trump years. And I need you to know that there's a campaign that goes on for whiteness, that people try to tear down those coalitions that build up naturally between people of good conscience. I call it a civil rights compass that people have that tells them what the right thing is. It's not about being politically correct. It's about doing what's right. It's about having laws that, that have love at the center of them. It's about having uh, justice as a, as, a, as a priority. And you'll see here, this is a white man's government. The campaign was put on to really remend the division between the North and the South and the Confederates uh, and those radical Republicans, those Democrats in the South, the political cartoon by Thomas Nast published in Harper's Weekly on September 5th, 1868. You'll see the image, the three white men with their, their feet upon the black man's back, depicted standing atop a black Civil War veteran, our five points Irishman, Ku Klux Klan founder, Nathan Bedford Forrest, Wall Street financier, and August Belmont. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest and Wall Street Finance and Democrat August Belmont. The campaign for whiteness was underway. Uh, I would argue, as you look back at the beginning of this month uh, and you think about the U.S. Capitol, I want you to think about this image. Plessy v. Ferguson. This was the end of the Obama years, right? This was the backlash to progress. There's always the ebbs and flows of history. You got to be prepared for the ebbs and flows. So anytime you pass civil rights laws and and opportunities, there's gonna be a backlash from people who feel like uh, you're investing in their demise. So that was a landmark decision of the US Supreme Court in 1896 that upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation laws for public facilities, as long as the segregated facilities were equal 
uh, um, were equal and in quality, um, equal in quality, a doctrine that came to be known as separate but equal. I want you to take a, a, a look at this charting of lynchings across the country, some over 4,000, close to 5,000 lynchings, uh, clearly an undercount. Um, but the official records of lynchings, most of them African-American, some of them white folks who had a social justice compass. Uh, I think about Springfield, Illinois in, 19, uh, in 1908, which gave birth to the N NAACP, uh, uh, the birthplace of Abraham Lincoln in Springfield, uh, Illinois. Uh, two black men were accused of attacks on white women, something you could experience today. Uh, think about the Central Park Five or the Exonerated Five, and they hadn't been convicted. When the white townspeople who had Lincoln prominently displayed throughout the town saw that two black men were accused of attacks on white women, they marched down to the, the jail that, that day uh, to lynch those two black men. And thank God for white folks with conscience, conscience. The black sheriff, I mean, the white sheriff, a white businessman moved those two black men uh, out of the town and saved them from being lynched. But it led to days of unrest and burnings and, and lootings and murder of African-American citizens known as the Springfield race riot. So I need you to connect those dots to lynchings across the country. As we started to see between 1835 and 1964, the murder of African-Americans uh, all throughout this country, um, you'll see there the, the sign that was posted outside the NAACP office in New York that said a man was lynched today. Uh, you can't talk about Amy Cooper in Central Park and her claim that the African-American bird watcher was, Mr. Cooper was trying to attack her, false accusation, or the young white girl who claimed that the young black boy took his cell phone uh, and exaggerated, or what happened in Springfield, Illinois with those two white women, or Tulsa, Oklahoma with Black Wall Street, which started by an accusation of a white woman who claimed that a black man attacked her without going back to, to watch Birth of a Nation. So I ask you, if you've not done it before, put this on your homework assignment. Go back and watch Birth of a Nation. As disgusting and vile as that movie is, I need you to watch it. Uh, it is a, a KKK propaganda film from 1915, the first film to be screened at the White House under Woodrow Wilson. So, white, so racism, overt racism and hatred has been in the White House before. This is not new. Uh, Woodrow Wilson segregated federal offices. But D.W. Griffith uh, campaigned across the country to pre present his film. 10,000 citizens, mostly black, marched on downtown Boston. Uh, with the NAACP and William Monroe Trotter to shut down this film that they knew would, would hamper and impact their lives, that would give uh, white citizens a free pass to create violence because it depicted African-Americans as violent uh, sexual predators. There's one scene in the film, if you've not seen it, where the white woman chooses to jump off a cliff rather than be attacked and touched by a black man. So I need you to know that these are not new tropes. These are old tropes that have taken different forms and whether it's how we watch cops today on TV shows uh, or how we present black men as violent, that's why we get shot within seconds upon a police officer arriving, Tamir Rice. That's why they shoot you, Michael Brown. That's why, because society has told us that black men are violent, they're threats. It's ingrained in the DNA of our society from slavery to the images. Uh, and D.W. Griffin, The Birth of a Nation is only one of many uh, go back and think about your childhood and who had good hair and what was good and what was bad and what was white and what was black. I need you to go back and unwrap all those things so that these things can make sense for you today. Red Summer, 1919, uh, after the Treaty of Versailles, which formally ended World War I, black veterans returned and were forced to grab their guns, some positioning themselves on rooftops in their neighborhoods in Washington, D.C., they prepared for mob violence in July of 1919. This was the Great Migration. Uh, some one million people or so had started to move out of the, the Jim Crow South and started to move north. There were blockades around the historic HBC, HBCU Howard University. In the bottom right, you'll see members of the 369th Infantry Regiment, AKA the Helm Hellfighters, who awarded the coveted Croix de Guerre from the French government then headed home after World War I, 1919 to Jim Crow. How much of a contradiction is that to return home and not even have your, your liberties and your rights for a country that you fought and died for? Because of their military service, black veterans were seen as a particular threat to Jim Crow. 
and racial subordination, so they were a threat as they returned home. This was the summer known as Red Summer with racist attacks. So I want you to think about Ferguson, Chicago, Baltimore, uh, the burning of the McDonald's, the racial tension, and you'll see there in the top right, just the charting of some of the race massacres across this country. But I need you to connect the dots around the hate, the hate that hate produced came out of the Harlem, out of the Watts riot. What does this tension come from? So as people marched on the US Capitol because they want to uh, make America great again, because they want to protect their Second Amendment rights, because they feel like their culture is at, uh, at risk. I want you to understand why people marched in, in Chicago and in Detroit and in Roxbury over uh, violence and over murder, police violence, over discrimination, over uh, segregation uh, in our systems that still exist today where too many neighborhoods, people are steered away from wealthy neighborhoods. I need you to know that about the 1919 uh, situation when we talk about Chicago, you'll see there, and I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, white children cheer outside an African-American residence that they set a fire in September, 1919, red summer. I need you to look at the black population that shifted dramatically across this country as black folks fled the South. By the end of 1919, approximately 1 million African-Americans had fled to Jim Crow South and the economic despair of the South and discrimination of, for Northern cities. Black population in Chicago between 1910 and 1920 grew by 148%. Philadelphia grew by 500%. I need you to know about this race uh, war that was going on in 1919 in Chicago when a black man in Michigan Avenue, sunny day, he's floating on the black section only. There are white folks on the white section only and he floats into the wrong section and gets stoned to death. And it sets off days of protests and riots and, and, and murder. Um, I love this African-American proverb. Hunters will cease being heroes when lions have historians. I want that to sit with you again. Hunters will cease being heroes when lions have historians. We've been waiting for historians to tell the true story of American history. I want you to know about the, the New Deal, which was the raw deal for Black America. The Great Depression was a severe worldwide economic depression that took place mostly during the 1930s, beginning in the US. The New Deal was a series of programs, public work projects, financial reforms and regs enacted by Franklin, Del Franklin Delano Roosevelt between 1933 and 1939, responded to the needs for relief, financial reforms and recovery from the Great Depression, the three R's. African-Americans were particularly vulnerable to depression, of course, like we are now with the, with the pandemic, because we didn't have the, the, the savings. Go back and, and go to the book, to the report, Color Wealth in Boston, and read the wealth gap that exists between black Bostonians and white Bostonians then connect the dots to the new deal, the raw deal for black America. Uh, we worked marginal jobs, unskilled jobs, service jobs. We didn't have access to unions. So imagine the campaign for unions and workers' rights and being screened off from unions, being screened off from those protections for generations of African-Americans. African-Americans were first discharged as employers often preferred white workers or preserved work for them when layoffs three times more African-Americans on public assistance than white workers. Benefits less excluded from unions, I mentioned. We talk about COVID-19 and vaccines. I, I, I need you to know about uh, Tuskegee syphilis experiment. That ex experiment, and you might be shocked, existed from 1932 to 1972. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, J. Marion Sims and his experimentation on slaves, I need you to know that he experimented on those black women without anesthesia. And we had anesthesia at that time. I need you to know in Tuskegee syphilis experiment, we were considered by scientists, by, by the medical field, black folks were considered the syphilis soaked race. We carried syphilis. We had bad blood. So the scientists and the researchers targeted black communities to do this work, 600 black men, which 399 were diagnosed with syphilis and 201 were a control group, similar to what we're experiencing right now with COVID-19. You have your uh, folks who are just the control, control group. But the problem here is that one, they weren't treated for their ailments. They weren't treated for their syphilis. They were enticed into this study because of care. They didn't receive that care. What they did receive was um, no treatment for their syphilis, even at a point that they had found a treatment for syphilis. So there's a lot of unethical history 
um, the, the taint of race in our healthcare system, which then brings it forward. I say, Deborah, sometimes people, I had a young person say to me, well, Michael, a, a young African American, I don't know about J. Marion Sims. I don't know about Tuskegee syphilis experiment. I don't know about Institute of Medicine's unequal, report, uh, unequal treatment report in 2002. And I say to them, but you do know about your mother squeezing your hand when you went through a bad neighborhood. She didn't have to tell you it was a bad neighborhood. She squeezed your hand and maybe told you, I don't want you walking through the street by yourself. That's how healthcare works. We transfer our experience and we say, don't go to that hospital. Don't go see that doctor. I'm not going in that clinical trial. They're just gonna experiment on us. You can't, don't go and participate. So we're dealing with that now in this moment of COVID-19. I need you to quantum leap into World War II and the return of those soldiers in uh, the GI Bill. Um, Service Readjust Readjustment Act of 1944, commonly known as the GI Bill, was a law that provided a range of benefits for returning World War II veterans. We, again, I mentioned, have repositioned Americans all the time. The GI Bill aimed to help American World War II veterans adjust to civilian life by providing benefits, including low-cost mortgages, low-interest loans, and financial support. African Americans did not benefit nearly as much as white Americans. Why? In part, the, the strategy was to dishonorably discharge many African Americans. Read about it. Uh, benefits included college tuition, low cost home loans and unemployment insurance. I'll skip this slide for the sake of time, but I want you to just focus in on this slide. The original GI Bill ended in July 1956. By that time, nearly 8 million World War II veterans had received education or training and 4.3 million home loans where $33 billion had been handed out. So if you are a white person on this call and, and you've done well, and you said, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I, my family came here after the potato famine or from or Italy or Poland or name the country. And we overcame obstacles. And of course there is major discrimination that existed in this country. But the one message that America sent to everyone who came to assure us was you can be poor, but don't be black. So as other immigrant communities matriculated in the front doors of our hospitals, got to get those benefits and those services, ascended into halls of power in the Congress and the city halls, there was still the African-American descendants of slaves who did not benefit from those dollars and those resources. So if you talk about the wealth gap, I need you to, it's inherently racist to think that you're smarter than somebody else, that you got the money and the resources. I need you to understand and connect the dots as Henry, Henry Lacks, the co-opting of or stealing of her cells, a black woman was treated unsuccessfully with cervical cancer in 1951 at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Uh, they took her cancer cells as a source of the HeLa cell line. I won't spend much time here, but Black folks know about Henry Lax contributing to the distrust. I need you to know about Brown v. Board of Education in 1954. Um, the court ruled that the U.S. state laws establishing, this is many years after Plessy v. Ferguson, establishing racial segregation in public schools are unconstitutional, even if segregated schools are otherwise equal in quality. S separate was inherently unequal. Um, Dr. King's quote, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back March insufficient funds. Um, I would argue that Black America still gets a bad check. I won't spend too much time here other than the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I, this is, this is uh, when I talk about white allies at its best. When I think about uh, Schroener Goodman and Cheney, when I think about uh, James Reeb, the white Unitarian Universalist minister who answered Dr. King's call and went to Selma to march that bridge and was killed uh, being an ally. I think about the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and those young folks in Boston who got on those buses to ride south and challenge segregation. That's what we're talking about, allyship, right? That's courage because that's speaking up in the boardroom when the policy is discriminatory. That's demanding that we include more voices of color in the, the distribution of vaccines or crisis standards of care. We decide who gets a ventilator but somebody says, well, wait a minute, this policy gives ventilators to people don't ha who don't have comorbidities. Doesn't it advantage white folks and not black folks and brown folks? So we need you to be in the room and be an ally, but you gotta be conscious and aware to be an ally. You gotta read the history to be an ally. Children's Crusade in, eight, in, in 18, 1963, when those kids marched on downtown Birmingham, Black Lives Matter, 1963, uh, that's not new. Youth have always been activists and challenged. This was not a popular campaign. Even Malcolm X, who I'm a huge fan, read, read and listen to Ballad of the Bullet, message from the grassroots. 
and his advocacy across the country and across the world where he gives speeches, even in London. But he challenged this putting kids on the front line. But here's where it was masterful, whether it was Selma and the beating of those marches in Selma and John Lewis or Birmingham in 1963, it tugged at the heartstrings of America. And I'll be more pointed to say it tugged at the hot streets of white America. So then they showed up when they saw little kids being hosed and sick dogs sick on them. I won't spend much time here because we only have a little bit left, but I'll say Medicare and Medicaid was a civil rights law because just in case you didn't know this, segregation kept us out of many hospitals, whether we were providers or whether we were patients up through the 1960s, a historical minute ago. African-American students were denied admission to most medical and nursing schools. African-American physicians were rejected from membership in most state and national medical societies. African-Americans were refused care at most hospitals in this country, especially in the South. So I need you to know this movement that happened in 1960s with uh, the, the Civil Rights Act in 64, and Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act in 65, Medicare and Medicaid, the evolution and the integration of our healthcare system because of civil rights laws um, W.B. Du Bois, Deborah said, nothing can be solved that can't be faced. So if you're one of those people who say, hey, I just, there's too much drama, there's too much conflict, it requires too much research, I'm just tired of race, can we just stop talking about it, I just don't see race, I think everybody's equal, then you don't, you're not, you're part of the problem. Because if we don't, we can't solve it unless we face it. So I need you to look at these images of slavery, this slave trade, slavery in America, the picking of cotton, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. I need you to read that 2002 report that validated what those activists were saying unequal treatment, that we weren't just sick for no reason, doctors weren't treating us the same, or a book American Health Dilemma, or the new Jim Crow, or the NAACP's report many years ago in 2014 called Born Suspect. We over incarcerate and under educate in this country. Or the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston's report, The Color of Wealth in Boston. I need you to read and understand about insurance. If you did not have insurance, which many black and brown people in this country didn't, Deborah, that means you didn't have a primary care provider. That meant that by the time you found out you had cancer, it was probably stage four and you found out in the emergency room or your diabetes was out of control or your heart disease was uncontrollable because you didn't have a medical home, a primary care medical home. So I need you to see these numbers. Mm -hmm. And if you thought about the Affordable Care Act or health reform in Massachusetts, it quite frankly saved lives. And I'll be honest with you, if I had had a bullhorn in the early 2000s and through the, the middle of 2000, uh, I would have said, before we get to march the streets on Black Lives Matter and I can't breathe, Eric Garner, George Floyd, if you knew how many black and brown people die unnecessarily because they don't have insurance and they're receiving unequal treatment, we should have been marching a long time ago or the COVID-19 deaths by race. I won't, you can do this research on your own, but the numbers, uh, as the Latin term, I went to a Latin school, so I'm always reminded of race ipsa loquitur. The thing speaks for itself. The impact of this pandemic on people's lives, we're losing our wealth, the little we had, credit scores, lost savings, the mental health and trauma born even more on communities that are poor, that are immigrant, the anti-immigrant policies that are driving people into the into the crevices of society because they don't wanna get tested, they don't wanna get traced, they don't wanna get deported, they won't come in for care and they may not get vaccinated and it is a poor public health response when anybody thinks that they can't get treatment. So if you want to uh, keep a, make America great again and you wanna deport people, first of all, that's impossible. Second of all, it's human, inhumane, it's not uh, uh, aligned with the ideals of this country, but Think about the fact that we're letting people hide because they don't want to get treated. And I often say lives over livelihoods. We're so eager to open up, we don't care about the death toll. I'll skip this on Medicare. Medicaid, racism as a public health crisis. Uh, where you been? Deborah? I posted something on Instagram the other day. I said, um, I said, I'm glad people are woke and some are waking up, but some of us are insomniacs. I mean, we couldn't sleep. We knew this stuff. We were telling you that the pandemic would have a, a, a disproportionate impact. We were telling you that it, with Amadou Diallo in New York, with many other cases across this country for decades, we were telling you that police officers 
were using their authority to kill black citizens and get away with it because they reasonably perceived threat, even though it was a wallet. And we gave them too much deference in the past. And, and guess what? And I'm gonna say this on this call, you can give the United Negro College Fund, you can not use the N-word, you can not ever think about lynching a black person and you can still be racist because of how you teach or how you police or how you provide guidance counseling to your students or who you sit with and eat with in the church that you run and who you invite into your home. You can still be racist. Say their names, the backdrop to America's healthcare system right now, these faces, you'll see Amadou Diallo on the cover of Time Magazine, Laquan McDonald. I will tell you, Deborah, one of the ones that drags me into tears every day when I think about it is Tamir Rice. That little boy that was playing with a gun in a park near no one, a toy gun. And the police pulled up within feet of him and shot him before he could probably put his phone up, his, his toy gun up and say, it's just a toy. And we kept it moving. So if you didn't con feel connected to that, there's a race issue because I feel connected to any time a white child dies unnecessarily. I need you to feel connected every time a black child dies unnecessarily unjustifiably. Every time a black man or woman dies, Breonna Taylor, I needed to, to wrench and tug at your heartstrings. I needed to compel you to write a check, to show up, to join the NAACP, to Urban League, to be courageous like Mary White Ovington, who helped launch the NAACP, a white woman, or William English Walling, or the Pillsbury family, or the descendants of, uh, or, or, of um, uh, so many other white citizens in Boston who stepped up say their names, see their faces. I'll leave it at this. They say, if you're not at the table, you're on the table or you're on the menu. So if you are sitting with your phone, tweet that right now. If you're not at the table, you're on the table or you're on the menu. And then my quote that hopefully I'll be known for one day is it takes time for truth to catch up to history, Deborah. And we have a lot of catching up to do vaccinations by race. I will leave it there. I know we went a, a, a little over the presentation time. I hope there's still some time for maybe a few questions. Uh, there's a lot to cover. This is a quantum leap. So you probably feel overwhelmed. You feel like you drank from a fire hose. Um, but I hope that this leads you to see your own personal study that you do. Check everything I said. Do your own research. Um, and then I need you to share the story of quantum leap. It is my personal mission to do this presentation anywhere and everywhere I can so that quite frankly, we can connect the dots. So thank you, Deborah. And thank you. Um, I think you're right. I think a lot of us are overwhelmed, um, but that's what we came for, to hear this history and to see those connections uh, between what's happening today and what has happened for hundreds of years. Um, before we go to the q and I do need to ask my, um, my yes or no question for my funding source. Um, so please, if you're in the chat, um, just yes or no, did you learn something by participating in this program? Um, just shoot me some answers. And then also um, please write your questions in the chat and I will read them. Um, so I'm just gonna give folks a little bit of time to indicate whether they learned something. Um, I actually have a bunch of questions for you, so I think I'll, I'll uh, <laughs> start it off. Um, what would you say are the most important things uh, for white allies to be doing? Yeah, and I get that question often, Deborah, and I'm so thankful people are asking. Um, one, I think we need to reach out to those 74 million people who voted differently in this past election. And I don't say that because it's partisan. I say that it, it because it's disturbing the Black America that 74 million, million people ignored the narcissism, the blatant racism, the sexism, the lies, the fake news, and they voted for that man anyway. So I need you to, to talk to your uncles and cousins and aunts and neighbors because that's, that should disturb us all. And I want you to, as I did the quantum leap, I want that you to connect the dots. We've been here before where people stoked fear 
and made, and quite frankly, for those who are Jewish on the line, we've been here before, where people with dynamic personalities and great speeches and knew how to tug at our hearts, our motive appeals, right? Our sense of security, our sense of right and wrong, the warped, um, our ethos, pathos, all those things, if you ever take persuasion in college. Uh, this past president, this most recent president, did it well. And 74 million people who I, I can respectfully disagree on with on uh, Roe v. Wade, uh, on uh, Black Lives Matter, um, made a deal with the devil. And I'll call it a Faustian bargain, right? For some Supreme Court seats or some federal judgeships or to be anti-political correctness. So I think one is we need you to be ambassadors of, of that compass, that social civil rights compass that you have inside of you and adjust it. It doesn't, don't go with your gut because your gut will make you do the wrong thing. The compass has to be a refined. That's by reading Souls of Black Folk. That's by reading Cass, Elizabeth Wilkinson's book or Kendi's book. That's by doing the research. That's by watching Skip Gates' documentary on Reconstruction or Warmth of Other Sons. There's so many things that you now need to dig into that treasure trove of history and then adjust your compass and then go out and you'll know what to do. So I, I say allyship is joining organizations like the NAACP. If you didn't think that it was your organization, then you don't know who Mary White Ovington is or, or Moorfield Story, the first president of the Boston branch of the NAACP, 1911, was a white Roxbury lawyer hmm. who led both the branch of the Boston NAACP and was the national NAACP leader. So I need you to know that history because there's a role for you. There's a place for you to step up. I need you to know about James Reeve. I need you to know about all these people, the Unitarian Universalist minister who answered that call. Um, and then most importantly, I think in terms of white allyship is um, you, have, you have power. Um, I often say of the 74 million people who voted for Donald Trump, I say that they're teachers, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're, they're referees in a game. <laughs> They, they have many roles in society. And I'm terrified how racism manifests itself in their decisions every day. Because if they had condoned what that man did, God knows what they do in their daily lives, whether it's conscious or unconscious. So we need you to be conscious. If you're the 84, 80 something million other people that voted differently, we need you to be conscious of your decisions when you know racism is playing out, privilege is playing out in your decisions, prejudice, and power is playing out in how you lead on your job and in the work that you do. Okay, um, I know I do have some questions here, so I wanna get to those also. Um, uh, lots of uh, thank yous. Um, uh, one person asked if you were gonna publish this um, presentation in any way. So I'm not there yet, whoever asked that question. Um, okay. I started this presentation last year and I'm, I'm trying to do it. You know, I accept the speaking gigs to do it all over the country and I've done it to a lot of major organizations and some coming up this month, but I, I wanna publish a book this year and I'm hopefully gonna finish it. That'll deal with uh, some of the issues I cover in the book, including as me as a young civil rights leader and my reflection back on my years of doing civil rights, the good, the bad and the ugly. Uh, and there's a story to tell, so stay tuned. Hopefully when I, when I write this book one day, you'll, you'll pick it up and read it. Definitely. Uh, we have a question about reparations. Um, if you could talk about that a little. So this slide deck that you saw today um, is 150 slides now. So you only, I think I only did about 50, um, maybe 40 or 50 slides. There is probably a good 10 slides on reparations that I didn't do tonight. One, connecting the dots between all those whether you're talking about 40 acres and a mule and special orders, all the way up to the GI Bill and restrictive covenants, right? The, the, the preventing of black and brown folks from moving into neighborhoods or, or redlining, right? Not providing resources uh, in our inst financial institutions and the role they played in racism um, or steering people away from housing developments. We sued the Boston Housing Authority here in Boston because they were steering black families away from Old Colony in South Boston and were directing them into Columbia Point or to Lenox Street where I grew up. Um, there's so much history in that that explains, if you add on top of that, 
the poor quality of our schools and busing. Busing, whether you like the, the outcome or not, was always around getting kids of color a quality education. Because even though poor white and black kids got a shaft in terms of quality, black people got less quality. Their books weren't the same. They didn't have as much resources. So it didn't work out because then there was white flight from those same school systems across the country. But the reality is um, it contributes to that social ladder, that social mobility ladder. So I'm telling you right now, there's a, there's a girl sitting in a school in Roxbury or South Side Chicago or Miami or, or Minneapolis or LA, and I don't exaggerate this, Deborah, who's meant to find a cure for cancer, but we'll never know her. There's a little boy who's meant to be our next president and have an economic strategy that will uh, improve all of our lives, but we'll never know him. Uh, or the scientists to build the next robot that we need to live um, uh, more conveniently. But we'll never know him or her because they don't have academic rigor, because they don't have the AP courses, because they don't have a studies abroad program. I come out of those communities. And but for the grace of God go I, I was able to overcome that. But why do, why do we expect people to overcome insurmountable odds to get somewhere instead of making sure that every child, child reaches their full potential? So when you connect the dots to reparations, I need you to connect the dots to this wealth gap that exists. And this conversation is, if you're so willing to reposition some Americans and some industries and some professions, America's never repositioned Black America, despite what you might think about welfare and some of these other programs. We're talking about repositioning people who for generations, including my lifetime, my mother couldn't be, like many Black mothers, couldn't be a doctor. On top of the sexism, add the racism. So maybe if she had become a middle-class person, then I could be an upper-middle-class person because she would have teed up the runway for me to get two degrees, three degrees. But unfortunately, because of race, race locked out generations of people from getting those opportunities. So we want to talk reparations. Let's talk the beginning first. And then we can join Bob Johnson and Sheila Jackson Lee in Congress with her bill uh, and the many others that are now willing to have a conversation about reparations. How do you count it? Who gets it? But I'd introduce you to Evanston, Illinois. And uh, a few years ago when their uh, legislative body passed a bill on and taxed marijuana and created a pool for reparations. I need you to look that up. I don't know how it's going right now, but it created a pool for reparations and then look at the reparations bills around criminal uh, injustices in Chicago, or the, the many of your kids, if you're on this call, the many of your kids who are on college campuses talking about this stuff right now because we weren't willing to talk about it and are willing to advance the conversation around reparations. Great. Um, I'm just looking to see if there are other questions. Um, do you think that subtle acts of racism, such as microaggressions, can be more dangerous than the more overt ones? You know, I'm not, I've heard people ask that question before, but I'm not sure ever how to answer it because I think uh, they all have uh, impacts on people. So, um, you know, when I think about uh, James Byrd and I think about being dragged behind a truck in Texas, um, and that kind of hatred and racial, when I think about Ahmaud Aubrey and how they hunted him down and killed him on a street for a crime he didn't even commit, um, and that that was rooted in hate, hatred, yes, um, it's all bad. <laughs> so if you're in a department store and you get followed around a store because uh, as I was a student in Minnesota in McAllister College back in the, um, the late 80s and early 90s, and um, they caught the store uh, 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 teaching their security staff on camera. This was the late 80s, this is not 2021. Teaching them to follow black, black people around the store because they steal. When statistically that wasn't even true. This was Carson Perry in downtown Minneapolis, Minneapolis, I believe, at the time. Or the black couple in Minneapolis when I was there in 87, 88, 89, who was in their home and they firebombed the home because they thought it was a drug house. They put an incendiary device through the window and burned that black couple to death. And oh well, happens. It was the wrong apartment. Nobody held accountable. Over time, how does that sit on the soul of black people? 
that every time we look to have our grievances, our injustices addressed, they're not because systems protect those because our judges are white, our lawyers are white, our jurors tend to be too white because voters tend to be white and they pass laws and they accept laws and they accept regulations that don't treat people the same or too many people sit on the sidelines and they just think it's wrong, but they don't do anything about it. So I'm not sure if microaggressions are any worse than, or, but I would say, I don't, you know, violence is the worst case scenario if you're a Maude Aubrey or yeah. Tamir Rice or Breonna Taylor. And then everything else is just a uh, um, pain underneath that. Um. How has being part of the NAACP changed your life or any aspect of your identity? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, one is I've just been, a, I, I know I'm, I have a calling. I'm in this work because I, it's my passion. Um, I mentioned I grew up in the projects and I wanted to do something about all those things I saw, all the injustice I saw both here and across the country. And I found a home in the NAACP. My first home was the Million Man March. Uh, a lot of people don't know that history. I was invited to with uh, my professor in college to join him in, in DC and go to the march with him. And uh, if you know a gospel group called Sounds of Blackness, some of the members joined us too. And we stood out on that mall with a million black men um, and it validated what we had already known, right? We just wanted to collect about our, the injustices we were experiencing. And I came home and I led the Million Man March Mobilization Committee, which that first meeting uh, at Reggie Lewis had some 800 people organized, ready to do stuff in education and healthcare and housing. And then as what often happens, the movement doesn't become, a, the moment but it doesn't become a movement. Too many people say, hey, I gotta raise my babies, I gotta pay bills, this is too much stress, too much drama, conflict, too heavy. They go back to their lives. So uh, uh, someone approached me, the Lenny Alkins was the president of the LACP, his brother, I need your energy and your talent in the NAACP, so come and work for me. And uh, I spent uh, most of my adult lifetime working for Lenny Alkins. And guess for those of you who didn't know it, it wasn't paid. <laughs> All those years I was president of the Boston NAACP and on the national board now is volunteer work. I also got a full-time job. I raised three sons, have all the other same demands that you have, but I give that volunteer work what many of you give at your paid jobs, literally the hours that you would give at your paid jobs. Um, because I know we, some of us, all, many of us are insomniacs and are called to do this work. Uh, let's see, someone uh, wonders if you could share a homework list, maybe email it to me and uh, folks can email me to get it. Yes. So you don't so have to come up with it on the spot. Um, I'll put my email in the chat. And um, if people want a homework list, uh, we can get that to you. So as I'm so as, glad that they asked that As soon as Michael creates it. <laughs> no, well, I created it already. So okay, I will great. send it to you this evening and you can share it with those who okay. want to. Videos, um, books, documentaries, all that. Yeah, great. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, someone says, um, I'm white. I want to learn and teach other white people about recognizing and fighting racism. It's not fair to expect the Michael Curry's to teach us all the time. Is that welcomed or is it weird? Um, it's, it's not weird and it's welcomed. Um, I think I hear a lot of um, white activists say that to me lately. And I understand where the movement is coming from, right? Is, is that there's too many Frederick Douglasses and Sojourner Truths out here who are trying to, to tell the truth and, and change systems. And white allies are saying, no, now we need to step up and we need to, to be that voice in the rooms where, and I, and I welcome that. Um, but I will tell you, it doesn't silence my voice because uh, I think we black folks need to still be advocates for ourselves. No one can tell our story like we can tell our story. Uh, but I think while folks are ready to listen, um, the person who wrote that question can be an ally in making space for folks to tell their, their lived experiences. Um, you don't know what it's like to be black in Roxbury, but you can invite us into your homes, into your, your synagogues, into your churches, into your mosques to tell this story. 
Um, and I think that is a huge benefit. And then be an ally and speak up because racism, I'm gonna use a little analogy, Deborah, and I'm glad we're gonna continue this conversation for a few minutes. Um, how many people, and of course I can't see you, so I'm gonna say this question and everyone's gonna shake their head in the house. How many people remember the movie Sixth Sense by Bruce Willis? One of my favorite movies of all time. And do you remember the classic line from that movie? Everybody, so the, probably 80% of the people on this line right now are saying it right now, which is I see dead people. <laughs> and I use that analogy in the sense of racism. Remember the little boy in the film saw dead people who needed them, him to help them cross over, right? They were dealing with some injustice, some, some um, experience with their death that they needed him to pay attention. What did he do? He covered up his head, he hit him, he pretended he didn't see them. That's racism in a society. If you really want to see it, you'll see it everywhere. You'll see it in the hospital, you'll see it in the classroom, you'll see it in the grocery store, you'll see it in the homeless shelter, you'll see it, but you don't want to see it. Just like that little boy didn't want to see it, because if you see it, you got to do something about it. If you see it, you'll feel guilty. If you see it, there's risk because maybe you get fired. You don't get hired. You don't get promoted. You don't get that raise. You get labeled. You get ostracized. So the challenge is, like that little kid in the movie, do you see dead people? And how willing are you to allow yourself to take the risk to see it? Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, someone wants to know what your Instagram name is so that they can follow you. Are it's you on so, Instagram? I am. It's so funny. I'm like the worst. I'm such the Gen Xer that if anytime somebody asks me something, I have to look it up. I don't <laughs> know. Apparently there are a lot of Michael Curry's on Instagram. So um, I believe it's Curry0968. Um, but I'm almost certain that that is uh, what it is. But before we get off, I'm going to try to locate it and tell you for sure. Um, but yes, I believe it's Curry, uh, Curry0968. I'm going to put that in the chat as, as soon as you confirm it. OK. Layout boring, right, great. You think I'd be able to do it quickly, but I'm not. Um, but I'll figure it out. Oh, here we go. Curry 0968, that is correct. Great. Um, and I think uh, we have time for maybe one more question. Um, although there are actually several questions here. Um, and you can string them. So if you read two or three, I'll just try to okay. cover a few. All right, I read, I'll read a couple. Um, are you concerned that support for the NAACP and Black Lives Matter will decrease because people have hope that our new presidential administration will make things better. Um, do you think it's possible for white people to, um, to lose numbers in America or will the definition of white continue to change to keep them in the majority? I'm not quite sure I understand that one. Um, and does this mean we will never fully get rid of racist ideologies? Um, so maybe starting with the first question, um, the reality is we got to remain vigilant because um, in 2006, we elected our first black governor in Massachusetts, um, second black governor in the country, Deval Patrick, a friend of mine. Racism didn't go anywhere. <laughs> you know, he served two terms. Um, and we still had the lack of black faces and voices, black perspectives in some places. And though he did some significant things that we lift up, you're talking about in you know generations and in and, and decades, hundreds of years of institutions that don't change overnight. Um, so don't, you know, when Barack Obama got elected, we were supposed to be post-racial. Um, just in case you tuned in, Jill Scott, Gil Scott Heron, I don't know if you know if people on this call like poetry, spoken word, but if you don't, I want to introduce you to Gil Scott Heron. His his poem that one of his classic poems is the revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be televised. Please treat yourself. And if you do, go listen to Amiri Baraka and Gil Scott Heron. You will, you will be thanking me like, I'm so glad he introduced us to those two poets. 
That being said, we know that the Clinton crime bill was devastating the black communities. And I was the one who, when Clinton came to the NAACP, I said to, I was on, I'm on the board. I said, when Clinton comes before this body, he should apologize for the Clinton crime bill. And Bill Clinton came and apologized for the crime bill and then got asked some critical questions by the press a few weeks later, days later, and got defensive. Even black people wanted that bill because they had crime in their neighborhoods and they wanted to do something about the violence. It was wrong then and it's wrong now. It wasn't like black activists were trying to tell, weren't telling Bill Clinton that it would pipeline black and brown people in prison, even if there were black people who thought it was a good, job, a good thing. The reality was it pipelined black and brown men and women into prison for nonviolent drug offenses. And I tell people all the time, I saw more drugs on the college of McAllister College than I saw in Lindustry housing projects. And I saw it in my dorm room. And my roommate in college went on to be a DA in New York and he sold drugs on campus. But yet Pookie and Tyrone and, and, and Jerry and them went to jail with three strikes. So it was never right. And I don't care where you are on this call in Waltham, I need you to tap your own awareness about the drugs you saw growing up, about the drugs your kids may be doing right now. And I need you to connect with those black and brown kids who may sell drugs to make money or they're addicted. And I need them to be your kids too, so that you see the injustice and the mandatory minimums in these street, street three strike laws and the disparities between crack, crack and powder cocaine. It was never right. Bill Clinton was always wrong. And though I'm a, a fan of some many things Bill Clinton did, I'm a critic of the fact that even under a white democratic president, or a black president, you can get bad policy that doesn't move the racial justice needle. I just did a press conference on the Safe Communities Act, the number of deportations under Barack Obama. Of course, I'm a huge President Obama fan, but it doesn't mean everything he did was right. So we gotta stay vigilant. Um, we're not post-racial. Um, Biden is going to try to reach across the aisle and do some negotiating like Bill Clinton did. That is where the danger comes in. What's the compromise? What is that compromise that may have adverse impacts for some communities? You gotta be watching for that. And hopefully with uh, Kamala Harris, there there's some checks and balances, but um, I don't trust anybody. That's not personal. I don't trust anybody. In terms of the, the second question, which I kind of understand, but I, I wanna come back to that last. And then the last question was around racism, about what was the exact question? Uh, does this mean we will never fully get rid of racist ideologies? Now, I'm hopeful. Um, you know, I'm not sure <laughs> if I ever had hope we'd get rid of it. That election with 74 million people who voted for Donald Trump shook my confidence. Because I can't even imagine, I can't even imagine a good hearted person who has any sense of God or justice or fairness or democracy, who wants a better America voting for that man. And they did in droves. So I don't know what the future looks like, but I know that we have to demand that we weed out institutional racism and the racism that exists in all of us. And I say, if you're on this call, you're racist. So I mean, that might, that might hurt you to, to hear that. But I tell you the best manifestation, and I'm just to, to make a connection, I say I'm sexist and it shocks people. Jim Browdy, Marjorie Eden, when I was on this show, I said, I'm sexist. And they were like, no, you're not, you're a good guy. You like women, you don't treat, I said, no. There's no way in the world, I'm 52. I spent my entire life being indoctrinated to think that women were less than at every TV show. All the systems, the parents, the teachers, the all the things that I learned over the course of my lifetime, how dare I think that when I gained some consciousness that I unraveled all that indoctrination of sexism and who was, who was uh, powerful and smarter in a, in, a, in a day. That takes a lifetime to dismantle what was given to me in a lifetime. So racism works the same way. Doesn't mean that you're not a, a good person. It just means that you have racism instilled in you. And I tell you the best manifestation of racism exists is that there's a black girl right now who thinks that she can't be you. She can't be a teacher, a doctor, or a lawyer because she's black. So the best manifestation of an ism is when the people who are victims of that ism believe it too. 
then you know it's ingrained in our society because it's, in, it's counterintuitive to think you can't do something, to think you can't be great. So I, I leave that with you as well. What's that middle question? We'll end it on that. Um, will the definition of white people continue to change to keep them in the majority? So I don't know. Um, you know, there's a, there's a nuance in that question that I wouldn't even try to get too deep into because I think it's probably beyond where I've sort of allowed myself to think through. But, you know, some Latinos don't want to be Black, right? Some Cubans, as an example of a, a, a Latin population that really tuggles with this racial identity thing. Um, I have some Africans who come here and say that they're not Black. Just because they've attributed all those negative stereotypes to being Black, I'm Cape Verdeans. You didn't know off the, Cape, the coast of Africa who come here and say, I'm not black or Haitians who are from Haiti, who are descendants of slaves, who think they're not black. So there is a, a and we know that race is a bogus concept, right? And if you know the history of racism uh, or the institute, the, the creation of race, but the reality is exists in this, in this country. And, and by the way, it's everywhere. So you go to talk to London black people or Puerto Rican dark-skinned people or uh, South American Brazilian Black folks to understand how pervasive this uh, issue of race has dominated the entire globe and relegated Black people to less than and to, to violent tropes and, and tropes generally. It is a world uh, issue, but um, probably no more magnified than in the United States. And it still is with us. So I'll leave it there, Deborah, to say, you know, to everybody on the call tonight, I'm going to send a reading list. What I'd only ask is my, my one ask of Waltham is if you've been on and, and you write, write about what you heard, even if you're critical of it, um, tell your friends. Um, I would love to do more of this presentation. Even I have a paid job as a president and CEO, so it's really hard to do so much of this now. Um, but I really think that this is an important message because you can't do DEI, Deborah. As much as everybody wants to say, can you come in, Michael, and talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion? Can you help us come up with a DEI strategy? I said, I don't want to give you a DEI strategy until you've sat through Quantum Leap. Because you'll always revert back if you think they're not qualified. You'll always revert back and you'll shoot them if you think I'm, they're, they're dangerous. They're violent with those braids and those baggy jeans. You'll always think, you know what, he's not going to take that medication, so I'm not going to give him that regimen. I don't want to waste that resource on a Medicare, a Medicaid patient. He doesn't deserve the same access as those other people do, conscious or unconscious. So I say to people, um, nothing can be solved that can't be faced. And I've asked you tonight to face that. And I thank you for doing that quantum leap with me. Uh, I apologize. It was so much in a short period of time. Uh, and you probably are feeling exhausted and want to go, go to sleep. <laughs> so thank you. And thank you. I'm going to end this live stream. Michael, if you could just stay on the call. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much for participating. That was fantastic.